And now we are ready to go into more detail with the panel when we will try to rethink the nexus between climate change, health, food, and biodiversity, which is very challenging because we are used to look at those aspects in silos, separately. We are a system. We have to move a step forward in this direction. And to introduce the panel and to be part of the panel, I welcome here at the anchoring desk of our F20, Stefan Schurich, who is Secretary General to the F20. Welcome. Hello, yeah. uh, uh, and uh, first of all, why is it so important and how are foundation approaching this kind of new mindset, looking at this nexus? Well, first of all, I think it is important to um, re-establish the fact we really want to put words into deeds. We know that we've had lots of years and decades of dialogues about discussions, and I fully and entirely agree this is the decades of irreversible um, um, legacies and um, we really have no option in non-acting or acting. Um, non-acting is actually a miss. We act either in this way mm -hmm. by not putting the switches into the right direction or we put the switches into the right direction. We just really put all these proposals here into practice. We um, 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 put up the um, policy guidelines for that, and we really need to address this to this 20 countries that are indeed in charge for that. Now, the foundations, to get back to your brief question, is, of course, um, they are um, at uh, the heart of uh, um, um, enabling organizations, but also they themselves are willing to take a stand in this crucial decade. And they're saying, no matter what our business is, we think it is important to really exhibit a clear support for these proposals here suggested and really point this to the G20. That's what we're here for. Thank you much, uh, guys, and uh, let us uh, just uh, show who is actually going to be part and parcel of the discussion in the next hour. And uh, I think we're going to have the grid picture that all of you know from our Zoom calls in the last year and a half. And we have a fantastic lineup. Ruth Richardson, Global Alliance for the Future of Food, Modi Mutswana from the Wellcome Trust, Jess Ayers, and uh, she is the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Where is the Zoom uh, picture that we want to see. <laughs> and uh, then we have Rhoda Verheyen, uh, environmental lawyer, uh, very important uh, these days. Last but not least, Martin Frick has already been half introduced. And with that, I'd love to uh, address Ruth Richardson uh, right at the beginning. Um, Ruth has taken uh, some time to already pre-record her message, and you've just heard it. Last week uh, was the important UN Food System Summit uh, in uh, at the UN uh, in New York, and very important because many dialogues, many peer-to-peer -peer talks were actually getting together. It wasn't top-down, it was bottom-up process, and of course, um, the Global Alliance for the Future of Food was there with Ruth uh, at the helm, and here's what she has to say. Hello, I'm Ruth Richardson, the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. The Global Alliance is a strategic alliance of philanthropic foundations working together and with others to transform food systems. Our members are very diverse and come from a number of different entry points. Some predominantly fund climate change and biodiversity, others focus on public health, others on farmers' rights and protections. What brings our members together is the centrality of food systems to all these critical issues. For this reason, it's a pleasure to be revisiting the health, food, biodiversity, and climate nexus at this year's F20 Climate Solutions Forum. I've been asked to speak briefly to principles, holistic policy responses, and global disparities. Let me start with policy. How can we find effective policy responses that encompass economy, equity, social justice, fairness, and the environment? Well, at the Global Alliance, we've identified seven calls to action, which we feel are critical pathways to food systems transformation. We have developed these calls to action in collaboration with hundreds of people and organizations over the last nine years through our research and convenings. What we have determined through this process is a list of imperatives that encompass the issues you have set out economy, equity, social justice, fairness, and the environment. 
These calls to action are one, ensuring participatory integrated rights-based approaches to governance, two, increasing public research for the public good, three, mainstreaming and strengthening true cost accounting, four, directing public sector finance towards ecologically beneficial forms of farming, five, redirecting other private financial flows away from harmful practices, six, creating and enabling environments for agroecology to flourish, and seven, promoting nutritious whole food diets underpinned by sustainable diversified food production. Each of these calls to action are critical in their own right. And of course, they're all interconnected and influence each other. We cannot move toward healthy, sustainable diets, for example, without influencing financial flows and subsidy regimes. We cannot have transformation towards agroecology, for example, without participatory governance. This brings me to the question of disparities and inequities. How can we ensure that the gap between the global north and the global south does not increase? Well, an underlying analysis of our calls to action is, first, we are in grave danger, whether from the perspective of the pandemic, climate change, or rising hunger. Second, practices and processes that underpin the industrial food system are largely at fault. The system is too dependent on fossil fuels and non-renewable inputs. It's at the root of eroding human health and rural livelihoods. And it promotes an economic system that results in liabilities due to hidden costs and global trade vulnerabilities. Third, and importantly, these impacts are experienced unequally across the globe with the burden placed on vulnerable and marginalized populations. We must acknowledge the underlying factors of these inequities, including looking at the legacy of colonialism and imperialism square in the face. And we must do all we can to build processes and policy platforms on principles of transparency, inclusive participation and shared power especially for women, smallholder farmers, indigenous peoples, youth, and marginalized communities. This brings me finally to principles. Our work at the Global Alliance is guided by a set of seven shared principles, renewability, resilience, equity, diversity, health, inclusion, and interconnectedness. These principles shape our vision of the future of food. They express our values, and act as a diagnostic tool for action that we use in our work each and every day. Principles are powerful if used well. They tell us where we need to go and how to get there. They're both the destination and the compass. For example, this is a conference on climate sustainability and justice. So we ask ourselves, what does the principle of resilience look like in this context? How does it guide our actions? Well, it directs us, for example, to embrace nature positive solutions such as soil carbon sequestration. What does equity mean? How does it guide our actions? Well, it means that we must ensure our food systems continue to provide jobs to the 1.6 billion smallholder farmers in need of fair employment, that those involved in food production must have control over the means of production, and that we have to be tireless in our efforts to find meaningful mechanisms for inclusive participatory governance and shared power for those at the sharp end of the crisis we face. We all know the global challenges, they are frightening and the trends are dismal. And yet the proposed solutions we hear are often the same old repackaged projects mired in ineffective and outdated project thinking. Systems transformation is not a project. It's multidimensional, multifaceted and multi-level cutting across national borders and intervention shot silos across sectors and specialized interests, connecting local and global and sustaining across time. Global leaders know that instability in food systems is a deep risk. They know the clock is ticking. And I believe that they are starting to wake up to the fact that food systems offer solutions to climate change, biodiversity loss, to hunger, migration, conflict, and pandemics. We must come together and call on world leaders to show unprecedented leadership and take bold action to transform food systems at all levels, from the local to the global, especially as we look to G20, COP15, and COP26. This will require moving food and agriculture into the center of international and national agendas as a central strategy for delivering on global commitments from the Sustainable Development Goals to Paris. It will require organizations, individuals, and networks to converge around shared principles. And it will require a degree of cooperation amongst nations, institutions, and peoples on a scale without precedent in human experience with equity at the center. 
It is possible. It is happening. Let's embrace hope needed now more than ever and act on this challenging, critical agenda together. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ruth, uh, for pre-recording your message. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, just again, context. Uh, I mean, that's what moderators are for. Uh, you mustn't forget that a quarter of all our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from agriculture. That is why uh, agriculture and food production is such an important part, also in the climate debate. And then when one looks at sort of uh, the systems that we have today uh, with more people being obese, than uh, being hungry, and every person that goes hungry is one person too many, uh, we know that the system is in complete imbalance on the user side. Yeah, Connie, you're touching a great point. These are global challenges. As you might know, Italy is one of the greatest agriculture producer in Europe, and we do have also kind of a food culture. And uh, so we will continue to discuss this about it with a global expert, Modi Watsama, which is one of the four speakers that are connected live with DF20 this morning. Welcome, Modi Watsama. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you. Oh, well, um, well let, me, let me introduce with this, because your job title is Senior Science Lead for Food System, Nutrition and Health. I think that your job title is already a combination of the main aspects we're going to discuss today. So my question to introduce is, how do you think that interconnection between the three dimensions can be played in a different way looking ahead? Because we know that changing the mindset, but also policies, investments, business model is extremely complicated. What's your experience and vision? Absolutely. Great question. And I think... Um, so the Wellcome Trust, we're a kind of a health-based um, foundation interested in supporting um, the advance, advancement of human health. And our approach would be summarized in three ways, which is very relevant to this agenda. It's about science, policies, and people. On the science, we need to support science-based approaches, which can really help identify what needs to happen. Um, the Eat Lancet diet, planetary health diet, which was published in 2019, is an example of this. It came up with a global planetary health reference diet, which takes into consideration what we be, need to be eating for people's health, as well as um, what we need to eat that is within the planetary boundaries um, that were discussed earlier. Things like um, um, greenhouse gas emissions, nitrogen, and um, biodiversity. So invest in the science to guide what needs to happen. That, that science then needs to guide the policies. And examples of policies which um, are currently unsustainable Agriculture production subsidies globally around um, 540 billion US dollars are spent on subsidizing agricultural production. Today, that agricultural production is both unsustainable and is driving high levels of poor health. Over 50% of the global burden of disease um, is down to pe poor people's, um, to poor diets. Um, Can you eat Lance, the Eat Lancet Planetary Health Diet could be used to guide how subsidies are invested. And that will mean in the global north, a shifting from a predominance of animal source foods, and in the global south, a predominance of support for production of starchy staples, towards globally increasing agriculture support for a broader, diverse range of um, plant-based healthy foods like fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, and pulses. Those science-based targets and food-based guidelines should also guide things like um, what food is marketed to, um, to people. At the moment, the majority of food marketing is for unhealthy, highly processed, um, ultra-processed foods, which are high in fat, salt and sugar, and also include junk foods, which are often sold by fast food restaurants. Um, if those subsidy, um, uh, um, the expenditure on food marketing could be reoriented with um, these science-based targets, again, that would be support health. Um, equally, food labels and also our food environments. What's available when we go out to eat in restaurants or go to the supermarkets, again, needs to be guided by what is both good for people and planet. Um, that takes me then on to... Um, Another aspect of the science is really identifying what works. We need to be much more invest in impact evaluations to assess which interventions work and why, and ensure that the, that the money we're investing to, to solve these problems is actually helping to deliver both the health and the environment. There isn't enough of that kind of impact in evaluations and assessment done. Um, we also need to bring together the different communities from health, from the environment, 
um, from biodiversity, from the just transition, to really start collaborating together. And some of the initi initiatives I've been involved in, both on the science and bringing together civil society, people still work in silos today. They aren't really enabled and um, to be able to collaborate. And part of this also comes down to the way we often fund um, interventions and solutions in a siloed way. We need much much be better ways and mechanisms of bringing to people together. Um, and that takes me on to the final point of people. And um, people need to be placed at the heart of the decision-making processes, the governance mechanisms guiding how we transform the food system. Um, civil society are the organized efforts of people and, and really need to strengthen civil society movements to really help um, support the adoption of policies, both by the public and private sector. Um, to help support the food systems trans transformation. The Healthy Food, Healthy Planet initiative in Europe is an example of an initiative which is bringing together funders and civil society from diverse sectors to come together with a joint um, solution and campaign to help support the sh shift to sustainable food system transformation in Europe. And we need to really enable and facilitate more of this, both as, as philanthropic foundations which invest, but then also as the decision makers who are solving these problems, really to get civil society at the heart, the people at the heart of those decision making processes and help redress the current parallel imbal imbalances in the way decisions are shaped and society is shaped for, for um, people. So that's a kind of over overview of some of the, um, the approaches, science, policies and people that we all need to take to really ensure that food systems become more sustainable um, and better for health. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Modi Watsama. Just a quick one before we move over to the other panelists, Connie, because this is fascinating, because when we talk also about food and nutrition, it comes also to our individual decision, and you just disclosed that you turned vegetarian in the last six months, and I have to disclose that I'm still on a Mediterranean di diet, which is kind of mixed, and, uh, but at the same time, when we look at the planet and at the future, for example, in 2050, we will reach 10 billion people on the planet. And so if we maintain this kind of food production system and uh, planetary diet, the risk will increase. We take the world as it is, but we know that there are forces that changes the world. And one of these forces is also technology. Would you make, uh, Modi Watsama, of uh, the help that new technologies can give us in the way we produce, distribute, and reduce also uh, waste of foods globally, from vertical farming, farming to precision agriculture to all the other stuff that are underway, and maybe we underestimate in terms of the impact that that might have. Are you optimistic, or don't you think that this could help make a difference in the future? I'm an optimist. I think absolutely new technologies such as precision farming, vertical farming, developing climate resilient crops and seeds, um, which can help withstand um, global temperature rise that we're seeing. They're all part of the solution, including things like alternative proteins as well. Um, in some cases, for those who perhaps um, may not be willing to completely stop eating meat, then they might switch to alternatives that are quite similar. I think they're all part of the solution, absolutely. But there are still some fundamentals that we need to think about as well, alongside those technologies. So a combination of changing the fundamentals around what we currently do, and then also investing in new technologies and adopting those new technological solutions, which can help to improve what we do and make it even better. Thank you very Thank much you. Uh, for that explanation. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think I could go on and discuss with you uh, for hours. But uh, we do have two fantastic, three fantastic uh, speakers uh, online already. And uh, let's be uh, clear of one thing. We can do whatever we like. Uh, the planet will survive. It's just the question of how we are going to live, uh, in what circumstances. And it is not so much about, if, uh, if you forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, who are actually here in the Meat Center, it's not so much about our generation. Uh, and I don't know uh, the age of the people who are actually sitting out on the digital uh, side, but it's the question of how our children are going to live and how our grandchildren are going to live. And therefore, we're going to bring in that perspective of the lives of the children, and uh, none better than Jess Ayers, 
uh, she is uh, working with and for the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. And uh, she's going to share her views now because uh, she's actually been involved uh, in climate, food nexus, forest uh, deforestation, pre-supply chains is probably one of your key words. So um, could you just please take us along? What do we need to do in order to assure the future for our children and much more so for our grandchildren. Thank you so much. So, so thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, so I lead at CIF on our food and land use systems, which is actually a cross-cutting strategy um, across the whole organization. Um, so a, a bit about CIF, our mandate is that all children have a right to survive and thrive both now and in the future. Um, so our work cuts across really fundamental raw issues that vulnerable children face, nutrition, child's rights, girls' rights, sexual reproductive health. Um, but about 11 years ago, we started a climate program because we realized that if these children are going to have a future, they need a planet to grow up into. So SIF's work is now, we're both a funder of development and, and children's programs, and we're also a funder of environmental programs. Last year, we developed a cross-cutting food and land use strategy. And the reason for this is because we began to realize that actually at the heart of all of the harms that we are seeing across all of our programs is a destructive food and land use system. And we realized that if we address this, actually we can address many of the goals that we are seeking to serve. Um, and so we passed a, um, a new strategy last year with the goal of supporting 10 billion people by 2050 uh, through a food system that is good for both people and the planet. Um, and, and it's really hard. Um, so to give you a sense of the kind of, you know, ob objectives that we're after, we are trying to both protect carbon sinks, restore habitats, seek sustainable food production, and also, as uh, building on the work of Modi and others, try to shift the world towards healthy um, and sustainable diets. And obviously those have to be incredibly nutritionally sensitive. Um, and the kinds of interventions that we are making, we are realizing have to be incredibly structural and systemic. So we are looking at financial system drivers to try and align the financial system towards a land use trajectory that can be 1.5 degree aligned and also hit the sustainable development goals. We are looking at coherent global architecture uh, for policies. So looking at the COP, CBD trade architecture and trying to see how these uh, how we can align incentives at the global level in, in ways that make sure that the, don't, the two different systems don't undercut each other. Um, we're looking at coherent national policies. So how can we ensure that subsidy policies don't undermine trade policies that don't undermine climate goals? Um, and there are two things underpinning all of these goals. The first one is that really fundamentally we have realized any transition in the food system and the nature system has to be a just one because there are going to be winners and losers in this transition. And many of the losers are going to be the people we care about. They are the poor agricultural workers who are cut up in this really caught up in this really extractive system. They are the vulnerable consumers who are going to suffer price spikes in their in their um, in their food purchases. Um, and the final underpinning um, underpinning thread across all the work that we do is the challenge that we face that Modi I think brought out really really well, which is the siloed working. Um, so as a funder at SIF, as I said, we fund both development and environment, and even we suffer from, from entrenched siloed programs and, and the desire to fund in a siloed way. Um, and this is really fundamental for funders because it is much easier to fund a program that is crystal clear, where you have clear objectives, clear outcomes, clear deliverables, where you can hold your grantees to account. And we also have our established relationships and our ways of working. And we are moving beyond that, and it is, it is really hard. We are having to face uh, funding risky programs where perhaps we don't know what the outcomes are going to be or the outcomes are going to be surprising. Um, we are having to fund in intersectional ways with new partners, um, and we are putting a lot of effort into, um, into breaking down those silos and building intersectional relationships. Um, I mean, we realize we, realize we have to do better. Thank you so much, uh, Jess. And of course, this afternoon, we're going to address specifically the financial questions and the change of the financial sector. Um, maybe just one very quick question. Uh, when you talk to financiers, uh, and you yourself, of course, as a fund, are investing, what do you take to the table in order to convince those uh, used to the olden ways, uh, to the old kind of thinking, that this new thinking, that the systems approach is necessary? 
That's a great question. And I think um, the answer is both complicated and crystal clear. There's a massive financial risk if we don't change the way that we are investing and financing. So, you know, I think the the, um, the financial risks associated with climate change, associated with the ecosystem collapse and associated with the kind of fundamental health problems we are, we are facing are becoming really real and really apparent. Um, we are really working on building the infrastructure to demonstrate those risks so that they become really tangible to financial actors. Um, but I think, you know, the writing is on the wall now. We cannot continue to fund in the way that we have all funded before. Yeah. We have to do something differently. Otherwise, you know, if if we even if we don't care about the right reasons to care yeah. about it, the financial risks are there as well. Yeah. Thanks, Jess. And Stefan? Stefan? No, I think um, I just wanted to uh, remind ourselves that is really an absolute key message that we also really need to embrace. And we heard that in the German elections just recently, again and again in the TV shows, what is the cost of climate action? That's the wrong question. The question must be, what is the cost of non-climate action? And only then you can say what the cost of this or that measure is. And I think this was just highly, highly relevant here, and I just wanted to re-emphasize that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that capital markets are already aware of that. Because if you look at the cost of capital for companies that are not green today, that's definitely higher than the one for and the multiple and the valuations of companies that are moving or are already green. And if I may, just in a very quick one, but as the <laughs> demand for sustainable investment is increasing in the asset management sector, this one risk that has to be taken seriously, which is greenwashing, mm -hmm. because we're playing with the trust of the people in sustainable investing, and that is serious. So my really quick question is, how do you approach this risk? And what can we make to prevent scandals that are already there? And in summer, we had a couple of cases in the asset management sector to uh, prevent that. Uh, another, another fantastic question, and one that is very close to home uh, at SIF at the moment, because we're doing a lot of work on the carbon markets. Um, now, the voluntary carbon market in particular is, is potentially an extraordinary tool to channel huge finance into effective nature-based solutions. However, it is widely criticized, including by us, as, as also being a tool for greenwashing, because it could, without the right rules in place, allow companies, investors to, to effectively buy their way out of their net zero commitments. So we are putting a lot of work at the moment um, and a lot, of, a lot of funding behind stopping this greenwashing. Um, so I think there are, there are two things that are needed. The first one is really clear rules around how and when you can use the kinds of tools like the voluntary carbon market. Um, so you have to already have your net zero plans in place. You have to be on a net zero transition. There comes a point where there will be unabatable emissions. Um, and at that point, you can engage in the voluntary carbon markets as part of a credible net zero strategy. Um, it's, it is only under those circumstances that you can claim uh, net zero whilst engaging in the voluntary carbon market. Um, the second thing I think we really need to do is on the supply side, we need to improve the transparency around the kinds of projects that are being invested in to make sure that we all can have total faith that they have really high social and environmental and climate integrity so that we can account for the social and environmental benefits of these projects and that the claims being made by corporates around these benefits are really true and meaningful um, and that they are, you know, absolutely slotted into and supportive of, uh, of, of jurisdictional, of national, national climate and environmental and, and social plans as well. So I think, you know, we need the rules, we need the transparency, we need the governance around these systems. And, and if we have that, then we'll stop the greenwashing and we will allow the finance to flow. A big question, of course, uh, for this afternoon's discussion when we talk about finance systems. And uh, now there is also another thing out there that has changed dramatically in the last couple of years. Absolutely. We are all waiting for global political decision, COP26, G20. But there's another source of change, which are courts. So lawsuits, environment lawsuits, and the applying of existing laws enforcing industrial groups and government to reach the climate target. This is what professional lawyers are doing, and we do have, and we're pleased to have today, Roda Verheyen, which is, if I may, the rock star of uh, environmental lawyer, as she launched 
uh, lawsuits in Germany, especially not just versus industrial sector like the automotive, but also forcing in the name of NGOs like uh, um, like Greenpeace, for example, and Environmental Action Germany that force off and will force the German government to explain exactly how are they reaching, planning to reach net zero by 2050. So welcome, lawyer Verheyen. It's a pleasure having you. Can you tell us what can this kind of action means in terms of the trans position we are living. Yes, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm very pleased to be able to speak in such a illustrious environment. I feel a bit like an outsider here because I'm a practical lawyer. What I do is take lawsuits. What I do is represent groups, various groups, um, including vulnerable groups. For example, my client from Peru is among that group for certain. And I'm simply actually asking another stakeholder to realize the things that we've been talking about this morning, the urgency and the need to step up action and speed. So um, I think what should be said firstly is that the silo thinking is not imminent in courts. Because what we're currently looking at is actually enforcing of human rights. So the point that was made before, the world will survive, but human beings might not. That's actually at the core of all of the jurisprudence coming out of various courts internationally currently. And I would say courts are already there to some degree. And I think what we can put down, and I'll make some points to that effect, but what we can put down now is that everyone delaying climate protection, and that includes the protection of sinks, as Professor Rockström was mentioning, is actually acting in contrary of the law and acting in contrary of human rights. And that is a very powerful statement, if I may say so myself, and that is also something that has changed dramatically, especially but not only with the judgment coming out of the German Constitutional Court in uh, April this year. So courts are an increasingly important stakeholder to actually deliver the speed needed. Uh, what are courts doing currently? One, they're actually implementing the Paris Agreement. They sort of overtake the diplomatic arena and they actually implement the Paris Agreement on a national scale. They deliver the transition from a temperature goal to duties. And that's extremely important. We've seen that in Australia, in France, in Belgium. We have now seen that with the in, with the judgment that I myself was enjoy, uh, was in, um, um, was involved in here in Germany, where the Constitutional Court of Germany actually made Paris a constitutional target, which is extremely important for anybody who understands the law, because that means it can also be applied between private persons and thus actually towards other stakeholders. Um, the courts also look at what does equity mean? How do we actually share a carbon budget? What do we do with the kinds of tipping points that actually threaten food security, human, human lives and human health? So we're actually, we're actually kind of battling a battle of all of these different agendas um, in the courts currently, not only myself, but all of the colleagues around the world who are taking climate lawsuits. Courts also, too, create the kind of momentum and speed that is needed currently. I was already said, but I myself feel this very much. And the best example for that is probably the impact that the Constitutional Court ruling had here in Germany. It only took three days for the government to actually kind of come up with a new law. And let's not discuss whether that law is sufficient. Um, mm -hmm. You know, judgment on that remains open, but it took not even a week. So we need that kind of speed. And we need that speed in terms of the implementation of all of the issues that all of my distinguished colleagues here on the panel and before were um, pointing at. And within that setting, it's also very important to say courts are an objective forum and they understand the science and they are able to apply it. And that is a very important way in to actually make people understand that thinking in silos is no longer possible. Courts also now call, actively call on policymakers, lawmakers, and the executive to actually put climate regards first and the regards of or interests of the future generations. However, some of the policymakers do not want to listen. And that is also an important message to take away. Um, we need that shift 
and also we need to communicate more about the impact that court decisions might have. If you take Australia, for example, there was a widely reported case in Australia against a coal mine and an extension of a coal mine where the court yeah, 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 yeah. adopted a very significant pro um, concept of duties towards new generations and the environment minister simply overruled that ruling. So this is still now in court, but we need the kind of discussion and communication around these cases. The public interest is no longer in fossil fuels. It is no longer there. That needs to be communicated in such a way that the courts can actually do their jobs. The fourth issue, courts start to address stakeholders other than states, and that is very important. I know that the entire climate community, the biodiversity community, of course, health and food communities have been working with the private sector in many ways. But what is happening currently, and not only in the Netherlands with the Shell judgment, is that major firms and major emitters are actually being held responsible. And that is important because we are a globalized world. We cannot tackle climate change issues, including adaptation in one single country. And it is necessary to actually regulate the effects of globalization through taking responsibility in multinational firms. Um, the takeaway line there is that any relevant emitting company today has a duty to come up with its own credible reduction pathway to zero within a credible budget. That is what the Shell judgment tells us. And that is what we will try and enforce in German courts now against the automobile industry, together with our partners from Deutsche Umwelthilfe and my clients from Greenpeace. Mm -hmm. But that applies in any and every court. And I think the takeaway message from all of this is that courts are an incredibly important stakeholder. They have become even more important because we have so little time. And the funding community, and I see myself actually talking to the funding community to some degree, needs to address and recognize this. And we need programs, not only not in silos, but we need programs mm -hmm. actually addressing that fact. And it is a fact. And um, that's no plea for more funding for me and more work for me because I have sufficient. <laughs> the problem is the communication. The communication around it can't just rest on my shoulders. It has to rest on everybody's shoulders. Everybody needs to be spreading the word of the wonderful, beautiful words that come out of all of these judgments in France, in Germany, in Australia. We need to stress that to lawmakers much more than we've done before. And that really goes to the heart of making, enabling the communities to actually do that. There is no funding for this currently and no, not sufficient, not, you know. Not zero, probably, but that is something that's really important because I, you know, the, the people that do it, that do this work in court, can't also do the communication. It's not possible, and we need to use the stakeholders and the, as I said, beautiful words that we have, um, that we have now. And the last point, because this is a session on food, the sinks issue is going to become much more important in the next couple of years. The courts will have a crucial role to play in that. So I would say that. If you look at food systems and the preservation of carbon sinks, you need to talk to the courts. And thank you for giving me the time, um, and I will uh, you, mute you, myself. That was great. You're very welcome. Stefan Schurig, would you like to elaborate a bit on that? No, I think um, this is, again, very, very convincing. And whenever I listen to Rhoda Verheyen words, I somehow feel really uplifted that this is really a hugely important subject. And as she is so humble, saying, no, I'm not asking for funding, I ask for funding not for myself, but um, I give this advice to any foundation who thinks, you know, what should we be, um, where should mm -hmm. we be putting our money into? Mm -hmm. In fact, what wrote us that is we're acting in contrary, in contrary to existing laws. And we need to help courts to make um, actually their job, to do their job. And by enforcing law, you need to be challenging existing practices. And this is something, um, this under the subject of climate litigation, is something that I consider as extremely important for our journey in the next years. Absolutely. It has a lot to do with funding and money, but also with time. And from that perspective, just in a nutshell, Rodolfo Ryan, you, uh, and it was impressive listening that the government took just three days to change the law. But your injunction to the automotive industry is to stop selling vehicles with internal combustion by 2030. Are you expecting industry to be able to be as fast as the government did just changing the law? 
No, but I would, I would love for the industry to actually engage in that dialogue properly. Mm -hmm. We have asked the industry to actually do that, to engage. How fast can you be? And what is actually impeding you? Mm -hmm. What is happening? Are you actually accepting that you have a personal CO2 budget that is actually derived from the International Energy Agency? Do you accept that you can no longer actually just, you know, um, set your own climate targets relative to your own output? Do you accept that there is a physical reality of the carbon budget? Uh, if we don't engage in that kind of dialogue, we will mm -hmm. not come to an agreement. Um, and I actually, I, I've been saying that this is no game. All of these lawsuits cost Im immense amounts of time for me and my colleagues and everybody else working on it. Also costs time for those lawyers who will work on the other side. That is actually not what we should be doing. We should be implementing. We should be implementing the climate targets that we all know have to be met. Well, but we, as long as such, you know, such large emitters do not engage in the kind of absolute terms that the Constitutional Court of Germany actually sets to protect human rights, no less, th then I don't see any other way at this, at this particular moment in time. All right. Thank you so much. With well, we, 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 don't, we don't have a representative of business right at the yeah. moment, but I can assure everybody that there are the forerunners uh, on the uh, side of industrialists, uh, even of uh, car makers, that are going mm -hmm. in the direct, uh, right direction. But uh, even as today, and of course, everybody knows mm -hmm. we've had this little election in Germany. Nothing is clear, um, uh, well. but it's supposed to be a climate election. So uh, focus is on that. And there have been quite a lot of statements from industry saying, give us clear rules, we'll achieve it. So um, you need to enforce the clear rules. Um, uh, the governments need to make them. And I'm quite sure, Rhoda, that uh, certainly the uh, Minister of the Environment did have sort of a suggestion already uh, lying on her desk before uh, the uh, absolute uh, judgment was out. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, and uh, we need to speed up and come uh, to uh, the last person uh, in our panel discussion, uh, a man predestined to combine the two worlds, uh, both of food and uh, of climate change, uh, simply because he's been working a number of years at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and he's been uh, working terribly hard in uh, the last year um, as the deputy of the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Food Systems Summit 2021. Martin, uh, the summit is over last week. Um, how are our to-dos, uh, can we actually work on a list? Well, after more than one year, I should know how to unmute myself. <laughs> well, thank you, Connie, and thank you, everybody. I've been listening attentively for the last hour, and this is a fantastic panel with just the right energy. And being a lawyer myself, Rhoda compliments, this is fantastic what I'm hearing and um, makes having studied law a little bit less boring than I always thought it would be. Um, but seriously, the, the main sentence, and let me start with what you just said, the implementation of the Paris Agreement is now with the courts. And one of my key gospels is that after the Paris Agreement, we finally stop with this crazy fascination about the UNFCCC process, because this process has done what it can do. It won't get any better than Paris, and if we have seen anything in this process after Paris, then it's a loss of energy in a sliding back. So stop focusing energy, time, money on evaluating a process which is not designed to deliver. Um, sorry, I couldn't say it any stronger, but it frustrates me to see so many good people, so much money being thrown into a process that has already delivered what we need. What we need is a 1.5% target, and anyone listens to um, Johan, and I do that every week twice, should finally get the message that the time is up. There is no reason for um, any gimmicking anymore, for any building of subcommittees and roadmaps and subcommittees to establish a subcommittee, to establish the agenda for a roadmap. We don't have time for this nonsense anymore. Now, coming out of the Food System Summit, for me, it was a wild ride, one and a half years, um, to see again what the United Nations can do and what they can't do. What the United Nations can't do is setting norms 
um, that would be immediately implementable. The old times of building a high-level instrument and then ratify it into national law are over, simply. It's impossible, and we wouldn't get the Paris Agreement today. But there are other ways which are um, gaining ground, and this is over the years, um, working with the UN, I have been seeing an ever-increasing engagement and, and taking seriously of stakeholder groups that it's about. Young people told us in the process, nothing about us, without us, and that slogan is actually coming out of the UN Convention for the Right of People with Disabilities, which I had the honor to negotiate as well, and it is exactly the core to it. The UN can only be relevant if it's relevant to the people we are speaking about. And in order to be relevant for the people we are speaking about, we need to have them speaking and we need to listen to them. So what's new in the UN Food System Summit? I think one thing or two things that we did were quite innovative and maybe even a model for other summits. One is that we decentralized the conversation, inviting governments to have all of society multi-stakeholder conversations around food systems. And that is exactly what happened. We have 148 countries, two thirds of, uh, sorry, three quarters of the UN membership who are actually hosting their national dialogues. And in many, many cases, these went way better than I would have ever expected it. Way better means really with meaningful inclusion of all societal groups, indigenous, women, landless, migrants, um, peasants, workers, and so on. And that is exactly what we wanted with a food systems approach. And I cannot overemphasize this word system because Connie, you said in your moderation, um, climate emissions from food is 25%. Well, that's the agricultural production. If you look at food as a system, including um, plastic wrapping, including cold food chains, including even the commute of people who are working in the food industry, we are looking at way south of one third of the global emissions. In other words, um, global food systems is the one bit where the world is most unjust and where it is <clears throat> most polluting. Mm. And I think what I'm seeing, and also in the energy of the summit that just concluded, with more than 160 countries speaking on a heads of state level about food as a system is this moment I personally have been waiting for for 15 years. It's finally there where it sinks into people that we need to fundamentally change. And I just hope, and this is, you know, in all this foundation world that I'm speaking now, that we can really now flip it around and say we have finally have an opportunity to make it better. Because the social side of the crisis and the environmental side of the crisis are so intertwined that we, on the contrary, have the chance to get both things right. And it's about participation. It's about um, empowering, particularly the smallest and most vulnerable communities where the power sits. Last sentence, um, out of this summit comes a whole compendium of work, and I would highly encourage you to look into that. You have heard from Ruth Richardson earlier. You will find some fundamental documents there that are not a negotiated outcome, but basically our essence of what we have learned, papers on governance, on equity, on human rights, on empowerment of gender, on true value and, and true cost accounting of food. And we hope that these documents make it into a mainstream of national discussions. And by doing so, we are jumping over the fence in a sense of an organization that always works on the basis of sovereign member states. By not breaking this sovereignty, we certainly can't do that. But by bringing a UN level of discussion and energy and thinking in national discussions where actual laws and um, all sorts of regulations can be can be found. So let me stop here, Connie, and I'm happy to discuss time permitting. Um, but again, wonderful panel this morning, and thank you to everybody I was um, privileged to listen to. Back to you. 
Well, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, the one word that I've heard this morning more than anything else uh, was not climate change, but it was systemic. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that we all haven't grown up to live with. So, Martin, um, if anything, uh, the UN Food Systems Summit was a systemic approach. What can we learn from the process and maybe apply to the process of coping with all these challenges of food, health, biodiversity, climate? Well, firstly, breaking silos is hard work, is really hard work, and it needs constant will of banging heads together, of translating languages, but we need that. Maybe our crisis of our time is experts, it's not generalists, and we need more generalists. We need people to look left and right. And we need to understand that the classic approach of taking reality and cut it into pieces and bring it in a governmental system and with different government portfolios is not good enough. We constantly need to challenge ourselves. And the best way to do it is to go down on the level where things matter. I personally am a big fan of the principle of subsidiarity. And I think in all of our national and even more global decision making, we must not lose sight of the local. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe my appeal to big foundations. You have big money to spend. The temptation is big to do that with big scale projects. But the change is happening when you spend little money in an intelligent way in communities. And I know that's hard. I know that the transactional costs are massive, but this is where you gain in that. Martin, always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, have you share your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we got uh, some of the messages and maybe actually today is one of those uh, parts uh, of your program, getting people together, uh, looking at it from different parts and not just uh, have a silo thinking. It Thank you dialogue. very much. Uh, this is a summit. Also Thank about you, Martin. Dialogue. And yes, <laughs> okay. and, and back to you, Andrea. No, I think that we had really incredible keynote speakers and conversation mm. along the morning, but we are less than halfway to all the works that we, we're going to have, Connie. And Absolutely. we are going to have also some session when the panel is over, where we will go deeper in some specific topics, will Absolutely. we? Absolutely. That's going to be this afternoon, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, there's always a good thing. Uh, if you don't know what to say, pass over the buck. Uh, and uh, that means, uh, Stefan, uh, looking back, stepping back, uh, looking at this morning, uh, before we actually sort of have the outlook uh, for this afternoon and for tomorrow, uh, what's your takeaway? Well, my takeaway started with something I knew before, because we obviously received the pre-recorded video statement of the former Secretary General of the United Nations a um, couple of days ago, and then we uh, had a glimpse into it. And I found it remarkable that the um, former Secretary General of the United Nations calls for a no-coal compact and called for a clear fossil fuel subsidies removal. This isn't something that we've heard 10 years ago. And I think that started with a very bold statement today. Um, I think we had a fantastic panel really looking into the um, interdisciplinarities between um, health and the climate subject, climate adaptation, climate mitigation, air pollution, um, energy and food, and how we, how we, how we generate fuel food in the future. So I think this was, this was really important. And um, the last two points that I just want to re-emphasize, um, we need to have um, the right um, financial mechanisms in place. Speaking about Mr. Ban Ki-moon, he also alluded to um, the need for a global price on carbon and to a mandatory disclosure of carbon emissions um, for um, companies. I think this is really, it sounds very boring, but I think this is really one of the game changer. So I'm glad to hear that the um, former Secretary General mentioned that. And lastly, of course, um, the enforcement of law, enabling um, lawyers and courts to do their job mm -hmm. Um, basically uh, is uh, an extremely important subject that we also alluded to 
in particular also not just enforcing existing law, but also maturing the law to crises and questions that the world hasn't been faced with in a um, couple of years ago. And I think that is really an important endeavor. So I'm, really, I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this panel. I think to the 500 registered or more than 500 registered participants watching us. So I think that's, that's really great. And I look forward to the next three other sessions. Thank you. Well, and the nice thing is uh, tomorrow we're actually going to do something and you're going to lead the discussion then. Um, Martin just said we need to look at the local aspect, which Absolutely. means cities. So what's going to happen tomorrow morning? Well, it's a, it will be all about the future of cities. We lived during the pandemic an exceptional phase where we all rethought our relation with the land, with our houses, with the spaces where we work, we live, we entertain, we move, and so on. So also from a climate change point of view, we know that we talked a lot about agriculture and the production of food, and we understood, again, that it waits for kind of 30% of the emissions. But cities makes another 28 to 30 percent. And the global population is again and again and will in the future live more in cities, even though with the pandemic we all learned that we can do some activities outside of the city. So we will combine, combine different points of view, experience and skills to understand what's the agenda of the sustainable city of the future, what kind of inter intervention and investments can also foundation make to make cities more sustainable. We already heard in the introductory part this morning, talking about social housing, talking about education. And poverty is not just poverty of money. Today, poverty is poverty in education. And even in advanced city as Milan, foundations here have been working on these aspects that not are, not are always on the newspaper, but are out there. So these could be some of the priority we're gonna discuss in the session tomorrow morning. And this afternoon, we're going to address the subject that not only Jess has uh, addressed earlier, but also Princess Noof in her speech, uh, shifting the trillions. Yes, there's a hell of a lot of money out there. Uh, it just needs to go into the right channels. And uh, in order to do that, the whole financial system is changing. They're adopting new ideas. Uh, they're trying to find the right pathways. They're trying to uh, make sure that green washing is not a word that is necessarily associated with the industries that there are. And this is exactly what we're going to look at this afternoon with various speakers from various sites, with the uh, development banks, uh, with investors, people that actually make it happen, and uh, what mind change is already out there. So this afternoon is going to be very encouraging. I'll look at my watch and uh, I'll take uh, all of you along. It's time to have lunch. It's time to do whatever you like to do of uh, everybody that's here. For everybody who's out there at their um, laptops, computers, screens, whatever, uh, we're going to see each other again at uh, one o'clock Milan on time and uh, whatever that might be in your local time. Last but not least, for everybody who's here physically, and yes, there must be an advantage of being somewhere physically, okay. Yes, you're invited tonight at 7 o'clock for something that is very Milan, yeah, which is... The aperitivo. The aperitivo at 7 o'clock, ah. which is kind of a local attitude. And uh, you will experience this here for those who are attending either at meet. And then there will be another interesting moment, uh, the movie projection. And, uh, you know, communication is a key. And also using uh, movies is one of the main uh, tools of communication and more useful. So there will be two appointments later on today. Absolutely fantastic. Talking about movies, uh, Johan Rockström also has a movie out. Well, not by him, but on him, mm -hmm. on the global boundary. So mm -hmm. I think it was on uh, Netflix or something like that. But just put boundaries and you'll find it. Mm -hmm. So um, have a great break. We see each other and we hope that you enjoyed this morning's discussion. See you.